Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So after 41 years of being one of Vermont's most respected journalists, in his retirement, other than crafting the guide that he's promised us about the best and worst gas stations in Vermont, which I'm still gonna hold him to, he's decided he didn't just want to be an observer of our political process. He wants to be one of those people who are creating our political change. So please welcome the Chittenden Central candidate in the Democratic primary. This is Stuart Ledbetter. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm thrilled to be doing this with you. We go back a ways. <laughs> we, I think we go back to when both of us started doing activism in the mid 80s, when, when we were the fresh faces at the state house. We were, although I was not in activism, I was uh, in journalism then, but I was just starting out. And um, uh, that's right. It, it, does it seem like four decades? Well, it's true. Yeah, but it, no, it doesn't. And I want to start by actually something that I had said to you the night of the last major election. And it's mm -hmm. one of the things that I had always appreciated about you as a journalist is that you reported on the news. You didn't interpret it for me. You ensured that you had collected all of the information so that I could then be informed and make an informed decision in response to that. So in that respect, thank you. And could you talk a little bit about your decision to become a journalist? And I appreciated WPTZ's 27 things you didn't know about Stuart <laughs> Ledbetter, because also to maintain that impartiality People really didn't know a lot about the personal Stuart Ledbetter, but you came into journalism as a result of working on your father's campaign to be the Vermont representative to the U.S. Senate. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, when my dad ran um, for the Senate, my both my parents uh, um, are and were um you know, lifetime Republicans. Dad ran for the Senate uh, in 1980, <laughs> almost half a century ago. It's, and I was a kid and uh, I was a volunteer, did grunt work and didn't know anything about this stuff. Um, and when I got to UVM, uh, the 1980 presidential race was in full bloom and I worked a bit on dad's campaign, uh, as I said, um, you know, driving him around and stuff like that. And I got to observe the interaction between candidate and reporter. And I saw the reaction that it that it sparked in in my folks and in the campaign staff. Um, you know, some of it fair, some of it unfair. And I thought there was just a little spark that that um, was created in the back of my head about geez, you know, this is kind of an interesting profession. And then when I was a senior at UVM, uh, one of my friends suggested that I walk into the campus radio station, and, and, which I did, and volunteered for some shifts. And that was, that's all that it took. Uh, I was just um, really uh, entranced by um, broadcasting in the news business. And that was really the genesis of... Um, you know, the jump to news radio and then to television and then both commercial and PBS. And it was a great, a great run, a really great run. It was a really fun thing to do. And and you've been reporting on the news in Vermont at some very critical points in mm -hmm. both our cultural and political change. And one of them that comes to mind for me was our debate about civil unions. Yeah. 
at which brought about the Take Back Vermont movement, which was probably the first time that Vermont really saw how ugly public politics could get. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like to report on that? And how did you balance having to interview people such as Randall Terry, who had shown up on our doorstep with all of your own personal identities, but still having to report as an impartial journalist? Well, th that's what you have to do. That's what you're trained to do. Um, people, uh, you know, in, in my current, and I'm sure we'll get into this, um, my current venture say, well, I, I didn't really know about your politics. And I said, well, thank you. That That's what you're, that's what you're trained to do. Uh, you're trained to listen, not um, look at um, at the news to the to the extent you can through your personal lens, and, and you know every journalist has opinions. Uh, certainly, I did. Uh, but that was a momentous time. I remember distinctly when the state supreme court, uh, just before Christmas in 1999, um, issued its landmark ruling that held that uh, what the state government was doing was unfair. Uh, was treating a class of citizens differently. And the S chief justice, a Republican former attorney general, uh, writing for the majority said that uh, Vermont legislature, you must do better. You must create, if not marriage equality, the equivalent thereof, um, because what is uh, unfolding now and what has to this point in history been discriminatory um, under, I think they call it the common benefits clause of the state constitution. Well. There was an immediate reaction. Uh, the legislature gaveled into session, you know, uh, a couple of weeks later, and there was tumult um, there. Everyone was on edge about, you know, not just what they had to do, but the reaction that it would engender across the state. And, you know, there was debate in some newsrooms about whether gay reporters could fairly cover this issue, uh, which I suppose would be something like, uh, asking whether uh, black Americans could cover civil rights issues. I mean, of course they can. Um, the, the, the key is that you need to look at this impartially and um, uh, talk perhaps to, uh, you know, the right people, the most diverse people. And I will apologize in advance if Mr. Marley interrupts us. You get down, you get down. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Sorry. We, we may to want to meet Mr. Marley. Well, you may not have a choice. I was going to say because Marley likes to no 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 no. Come on, come on, come on. Hey. I was going to say because one of the few sort of I'm sorry about that. No, it's quite all right. One of the few personal things that had been disclosed on air over the years, and I always remembered it, was your love of orange cats. I do. I know, and this is another one. I I I lost my my uh, last one in the the last week of my career. Actually, uh -huh. that week started. And you know you have to be up and yeah. stuff um and i had to put him down on that monday morning and it was um oh. it was it was uh, not the best way to start the week but oh, back I'm to sorry. The, the, well no i was you. gonna say, i was gonna say it maintaining that sense of objectivity yeah and knowing the impact that those public debates have and and i've always appreciated living in vermont where we do bring about change in public forums. During your tenure, what did you see as being the significant pivot points for Vermont, both culturally, politically, and just sort of the change in environment? Well, environment, uh, for one, um, in, the, in the 70s, um, really Vermont started to embrace um, the environmental movement uh, we had an influx of a lot of people um, from other states. Uh, Act 250 had been passed uh, in 1970, uh, I guess. And so that was, that's Marley's tale. Hey, um, all right, fine. Hold on, Keith. This is it, and then you've got to go away. This is Mr. Marley. <laughs> hello, hello, Mr. Marley. Hello. Would you say hello? Would you say hello? Now, show some manners. Uh, so environmental movement, one, anti-nuclear um, movement that really was 
closely aligned. And that sparked a big conversation um, during my time in the uh, early mid mid 2000s and, and early 2010s about whether to um, really make a, a quantum shift in our energy sources. But to me, civil union and, and marriage equality during my time was the most significant debate that generated, as you say, some ugliness in our politics, the Take Back Vermont movement and the signs, those black and white signs that popped up across um, uh, pockets of Vermont. They weren't everywhere, um, but they were certainly evident if you drove around and, and I drove around a lot. So, um, you know, those would be the things. Politically, Vermont turned out to be a fantastic place to be a political reporter over the last, you know, three or four decades. Um, <laughs> do, do you know who who would forget the the impact that we had when um, our Republican U.S. Senator Jim Jeffords uh, decided to quit the GOP, become an independent, caucus with the Democrats in a 50-50 Senate, and throw uh, you know sand into the George W. Bush's um, new term. Uh, it was, you know, it was unbelievable what happened. And I was down in Jeffords' office in Washington trying to pry uh, his decision from, from either the senator or his wife. I thought I might have an in with Liz Jeffords, but uh, no, he wanted to come back to Vermont and tell folks here um, the following day, and he did. Um, three presidential campaigns, uh, one from Howard Dean and two from, from Bernie Sanders, um, you know, Many states far larger um, than this one have not produced a single presidential campaign over the last 30 years, and we've produced three. So um, aside from that, you know, um, those those big debates over energy, now climate, um, it's been a very fertile um, uh, career choice uh, for me, and I had no idea it was going to be the case when I started back in 1983. Okay, so I want to transition from that to you know the legislative process probably better than most people. And you've seen the positive, the negative, the flaws. What made you decide that you wanted to be not just an observer, but a participant in that process? Well, it, it, it is something I have thought about for many years. Uh, I've covered the legislature really since 2000, um, and then a little bit back in the late 80s, because uh, I spent a, a decade in, in management. But uh, I, I just always thought it was a really interesting place. Um, the, the state house, it's small, it's, it's, it's pretty intimate. Uh, and it's the nexus of every major issue that matters in Vermont. Uh, in one way or another flows through that building, uh, through the 150 member house and 30 member Senate. And um, I just thought, you know, someday when I'm able to do it, because you certainly can't do anything uh, that uh, um, might be considered advocacy when you're a journalist under the terms of your, <laughs> 20-page employment contract written by lawyers. I mean, you, you know, you, that that's off the table. But when you can do it, I always thought it'd be interesting to do it. Not everybody agrees with me on that. Uh, a lot of my friends in the news business, you know, wouldn't be caught dead running for the legislature. They just have no interest. And I understand that too. But uh, for me, I always thought it would be good to do. And and I was going to, I was frankly going to take a year off before I did, but that the calendar didn't work that way. Uh, so it was now or two years from now, and I didn't trust myself to not get, you know, tied up in something else. Uh, so I decided to dive in this year. I, I think I think I because of my time in journalism, uh, I I think of myself as a, you know, more of a listener than uh, someone who just likes to to talk endlessly, although your viewers may disagree because this is a talk show. But you know what I mean? Uh, I'm interested in, in finding consensus. I'm interested in bringing the temperature down. I, I'm not interested in toxic politics at all. 
and I will do uh, what I can to uh, to contribute along those lines. So people, if you are people's choice, they can expect what I've learned of Stuart Ledbetter, which is you're going to ensure that you have information from all those involved, that everyone has equal access, equal voice, and then make a decision based upon that. Yeah, and, I, yeah, that's about right. And with that said, what are the issues that are important to you? What are the things before the legislature for which it's where you would choose to put your attention or these are the types of bills that you would look at introducing and sponsoring? Well, as I have noticed that a lot of freshmen sponsor an awful lot of bills or co-sponsor an awful lot of bills. And I, I don't know that that's entirely necessary, particularly when you are still, you know, learning which way is north. But uh, there are three, there are a lot of good issues. Uh, you know, these are not the only three that matter, but, um, you know, you have to narrow it down. And so my issues uh, that I've always been interested in, uh, in my television career, and certainly on uh, Vermont This Week on PBS, were um, uh, were tended to be um, economic. Uh, I think that the severe shortage of housing in our state is uh, choking uh, Vermont and will only get worse if we don't do everything we possibly can to expand our housing supply. And that can take many forms. Um, but I have worked with so many people, Keith, who are in the first you know, 10 or 12 years of their careers who come to Vermont and who um, do uh, you know do two or three years here and pay a fortune in rent and look at their checkbook and say you know I cannot um, stay here I can't stay here I can't afford it because it's the rents are out of control and there's no chance of me getting uh, a mortgage to buy something as much as I'd like to or to start a family here. If, if, if that continues, then we're exporting a whole generation of people. And in an aging state, that's fatal. I mean, it's just that simple. We have to, we have to change that. And we have to try everything all at once to do that. We have, there are a lot of levers the state government can push um, to stabilize rents, uh, ideally to reduce rents. And I think we can as supply increases. It's just a supply and demand thing. Second thing, um, is, you know, you can't um, reach any other conclusion when you go door to door, as I've been doing, about how much concern there is about the cost of living here. Um, you know, there's been much made about the, uh, rightly so, about the uh, 14 or more percent uh, increase in property taxes that, depending upon when this airs, um, you know, will be arriving in your mailbox um, in early July. And... Uh, but that's not the only thing. Um, yeah, we, we are going to need some public education system restructuring, maybe funding restructuring, uh, because that's everyone knows that's not sustainable. But it's also the price of health care and, and, and our health premium. Blue, Blue Cross wants between 10 and 20 percent more later this year. It's the cost of child care if you can get it. Now, there's, a, I think, a very promising bill that... Um, uh, will kick in this year that uh, we hope will make a real difference. Um, but the cost of everything is clearly on a lot of people's minds. And the third, when you are in Chittenden Central, uh, as I am, is the is the condition of downtown Burlington. Um, it's it's shaky, and uh, and I take no joy in that. It's just you know you you can't reach any other conclusion when you go downtown. And most of the business people downtown will tell you the same thing. Um, it's driven by our drug epidemic, uh, the fentanyl crisis, uh, the uh, rise in our homeless population. We, we, have, we have at least three, maybe 400 people, unhoused people living outdoors uh, in the greater Burlington area uh, every night. Um, we have to do better in terms of housing, uh, 
our people. And um, and we have to we have to do better in terms of, you know, the retail theft and graffiti is I mean, I've seen it several times and I don't pretend to be, you know, exceptional here. Uh, I mean, it's blatant. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes there's no police officer to respond. Uh, you know, Burlington's a big tourist um, uh, magnet for our state, in addition to it being an economic engine for the people who live here. And, you know, the state can do a lot, I think, to, to help um, Burlington, to help support City Hall uh, in, you know, in the in the months and years ahead to, to help it thrive once again. I'd really like to see that. And with that, I need to say thank you and remind people that you're the Democratic candidate, Chittenden Central, which is a greater portion of Burlington, Winooski, parts of Essex Junction, Essex Town, and that the primary is on Tuesday, August 13th. If and I could say, yes, if I could say ballots are available right now and you can go to uh, you can call your city or town clerk, and you should right now, so that you can vote um, well in advance. Uh, MVP.Vermont.gov, uh, MVP, my voter page, .Vermont.gov. You can request a ballot. It'll be sent right to your house, and you can um, take care of business so that you are unencumbered in the middle of August. <laughs> and And with that, we will make sure that that site gets put up and the site for your campaign if people want oh, to become you. more actively involved. And with that, thank you. Thank you to Marley, who, <laughs> who I hope you've been listed as your campaign manager. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's uh, yes, he works cheap. He works for Kibbles. <laughs> and I look forward to inviting you back. Keith, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Everybody out there in LGBTQ land, um, I have with me today Gail Marlene Schwartz, who wrote Falling Through the Night, a wonderful novel that I really, really enjoyed. So let's say hi to Gail and welcome her to the show. Hi, Gail. Hi, Linda. So it's good to be here. Thank you so much. Um, let's get the audience acquainted with you a little bit. I know you live in Vermont. Yep. Um, I, actually, I actually live in Montpelier. Really? That's well, um, funny we haven't crossed paths. I know. Well, I, when I dropped the book off, I, I literally walked to your house to drop the book off. Yeah. So, so it, there you go. Yeah. It, and actually, um, I've only been here since October, but I used to live here back in the um, the early 2000s. And I, I've lived in many different places, including Canada. And I always said, my favorite place and the place if I could ever return to would be Montpelier. So the fact that I get to live here again is thrilling. All right. Yeah. Well, welcome back to Vermont. Where are hey. you from originally? Uh, Rochester, New York. Uh-huh. Yeah, Buffalo, Western New York. Yeah. Yeah. My partner's from Buffalo. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. There's always lots that's of Western New York. Shirt. Buffalo. Oh, right. that's, great. that's great. Um. So tell us a little bit about yourself and um, who you are and just get us acquainted. Okay. Um, well, I, like I said, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and um, I went to Boston for college. I went to Tufts University and uh, I come from a fairly conservative family, a Jewish family, and there really wasn't a lot of, there was encouragement about developing skills and talents, but um, I was a super, super creative kid. And the message really was, you can't do that for your profession. You gotta be practical. You had to be a lawyer, a teacher, a doctor. So I ended up going to law school, um, but uh, I was, you know, I was progressive, I was queer, um, I did legal services. And that's actually my first job was in Vermont was legal services. And um, some family had moved to Vermont to the, the St. Albans Fairfax area. And it's funny because I was just speaking at St. Albans Pride and I told them this story. I remember the first time I visited Vermont ever, it was to go to Jeff's Maine Seafood. That's where I was meeting my family. And, and I remember driving through St. Albans and thinking I could never live here because I would be scared all the time. Yeah. And that was in the early 2000s. 
and now last Saturday they had their first pride festival. So things have, things have changed a lot. Like it's, it's a lot looser, a lot more accepting, a little bit more diversity. Like there, there were still some, some trucks that were kind of screeching and making noise and, you know, sort of harassing, but nothing dangerous. So um, anyway, so that was my first. And I rem- I just remembered that last weekend when I was speaking at pride, I was like, wow, Vermont has changed a lot in, in 24 years. So in um, St. Albans, they have like monthly LGBTQ, they all meet at a bar and hang out. So I don't know. Yeah, it's really, I mean, there's, you know, there's the gentrification piece, which is really hard. So it's not, I don't think it's one sided. I think there's problems yeah. that too, but I really do think that the level of acceptance for people like us is is really has changed a lot for the better. Um, yeah, so um, I ended up pursuing a career in copywriting and editing. I'd always been sort of a good, you know, people, my friends would come to me to help them proofread their English papers, and I was an English major. And so when my son was born, I was with my my partner, who's now my best friend, but she, she was in Canada, and um, I needed something that I could do from home. Um, and so I read about this copywriting thing and I thought, oh, I can use my writing and editing skills. And at the same time, I had been working at the community college. I had been doing some advising, but also teaching. So I'm still doing that. I still teach English composition this fall. I'm teaching creative writing. Um, so and yeah, now I'm also working for a plum consulting. I don't know if you know Jason Lorber. He's in the community. He's a former legislator, but he has a consulting company and I'm working with him as an associate. So that's what I'm doing for my pay, my job for pay. But um, my passion is writing. And I also, during the pandemic, I co-founded a digital literary magazine called Hodgepodge Literature and Art. And that's a real passion project too. So those are my, you know, writing is is really where I put my creative energy. How often does it, go, does it come out? We we publish twice a year, so two hey. two issues. Yeah. And do you do like uh, nonfiction, fiction? I mean, do you have a we, wide range? We do all fiction um, because we have a pretty unique process. We we have um, artists who submit images, and then we have each of our writers, our guest writers, select an image that they use as a prompt for a story. So like so i'll have a painting that's um that's my prompt i'll write a story in response to the painting and then we have our art editor he then goes in and illustrates the stories so there's like there's two degrees of response it's very collaborative how can people find you um hodgepodge literature and art uh it's it's on we have face we're in the process of getting a website we're only we're going into our third year so we're still pretty new but if you google hodgepodge literature and art um, we're on instagram we're on facebook we're on um tiktok you know or twitter all of those okay so audience get out there and look for that it sounds like a great project yeah. um, what made you write this book and what inspired you to do this well, writing has always been a way that I've kind of touched base with myself and um, processed my own internal experiences. And I've I've struggled with mental health issues throughout my life. I've struggled with anxiety and um, some depression, but mostly anxiety. And when I got pregnant, um, I, I had a twin pregnancy. And there's a lot of my biography that's in the story. So um, as soon as my son was born, I started, I just started writing essays. Um, You know, I I was journaling, but then I was also writing these essays. And the first one that I submitted, this was the first time I'd ever submitted for publication. I'd always written, but I never tried to publish anything. The first one I sent, it was to an anthology and it got accepted and I got amazing feedback on it. I was really surprised. And then I submitted to a contest and I got honorable mention. So it was very encouraging. And it's also very unusual. Usually you have to submit a lot to get even yeah. one. And that did not last. Trust me, it was a real fluke, but, um, but I was encouraged. And so I ended up writing maybe like six or seven of these essays about queer motherhood with anxiety. And then um, I was thinking, oh, it'd be nice to to think about a book, you know, to maybe make these into a book. And I don't know if you know, 
the Canadian writer Betsy Warland. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a she's a you should look her up. She's a really well known um, lesbian Canadian writer. She's she's you know won all kinds of awards and she's brilliant. And so I was able to hire her as a developmental editor for this collection, which I, I thought it was a collection. And um, and she's very old fashioned. She like prints everything out and she does her feedback with pencil. And, you know, I, and I love that. I thought that was just so cool because everyone works digitally and it's it's very disembodied. So so I was at her apartment in Montreal and all the papers were spread all over the floor with, you know, these notes. And I was just feeling kind of overwhelmed. And I'm just like, oh, you know, this is just never it's just never going to come to I couldn't find the thread. And we were just kind of sitting there and she looks up at me like something had struck her and she said do you think this material might want to be a novel <laughs> and we a lot of us have these moments in our project where something kind of congealed and and it was really remarkable because i was both thrilled and terrified because my answer was oh yeah it's a novel that's true and then I can't write a novel. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I'm not good enough to do that. I've never thought about doing that. I'm, you know, I just thought it's impossible, but I was also excited. So I thought, cause what was interesting, the experiences were interesting, writing about myself as a character, not interesting. So what I decided to do was to create some fictional characters and kind of like put them into these experiences that I had had and have those characters live those experiences differently than I did. So that's kind of how it came about. And how long did it take you to write your book? Oh my gosh. Um, probably about eight years. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's from like the first essay through the last round of proofreading. So, and it's also not like I would never recommend doing it that way because it, it, it's, it's not really plotting. It's not really pantsing. Those are the two ways that we talk about doing novels. Plotting is where you do an outline and then you go and fill it in. Pantsing is like going by the seat of your pants and you're just like, blah, 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 blah. But it's at least one thought. It's it's one thing where I had all of this plot material and I had to, it, yeah, it was it was a mess, but um, but it was fun. It was fun once I really knew what I wanted to do. And, um, so that's what I was going. To, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, did you write the book straight through? But no, I, you, I, your process was really different. Um, and um, so um, your book hits on quite a few social issues, quite a few, queer identity, chosen family, mental health, uh, generational trauma, adoption, and immigration. You hit a lot of them there. And so um, why are these of interest to you? Partly because I know that you have anxiety and that you have had some mental health issues. Um, and I think uh, chosen family is something that a lot of people in the LGBT community can identify with having to leave some, having to leave their families behind and, 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 uh, adopt new families. Uh, so is that what drove you to those social issues was wanting to talk about uh, mental health and, uh, you know, adoption, all of it? Well, I, I often I just draw a lot from my lived experience, my interest in those topics, a lot of them are because I've I've lived them myself. The adoption is actually not something that I lived, I'm not adopted. But um, I did give up my um, my son's twin for adoption. And when that happened, I remembered a girlfriend that I had who was adopted and she was the first person close to me who had had that experience. And she talked a lot about her adoption trauma. And I was, I was just very interested because again, it was just, it was something very different than what I had lived. And so I think a lot of times, and, and when I'm, when I'm writing a lot of times, I just watch the movie in my head. So like I'm working with these characters and stuff will just sort of come, I guess, out of my subconscious. And and this whole thing with Audrey being adopted, that just kind of spontaneously happened. It was very organic. So you must have had 
I know, like being adopted myself, we talked about this before the show, was, you know, it rang so true to me. And I was wondering, did you do the research through your friend or other people who were adopted about the trauma and anxiety and, you know, all of the emotions that come with being adopted? Well, I did a lot of reading. I, you know, anytime that I'm writing, I always like to read about, even if it's an experience that I had, I just like to go online and poke around and um, I'm not in touch with that girlfriend. So, but, but I, I remembered a lot of what she had talked about, even just the fact of adoption and being a trauma, that was new information to me at the time I was in my thirties. Um, I'm curious, like, can I ask you how it resonated? Like, I, I'm super, because you're the first person, like I was saying, you're the first adoptee that I've actually talked about the book with. So I'm I'm curious what what your experience with it was. Well, you know, her ambivalence about, um, you know, her friend is it Jessica kept saying, you know, find your parents, find your parents, find your birth parents. And the character, uh, Audrey kept saying, no, 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 I'm not interested. I don't want to do that. You know, and part of it was because she felt disloyal to her mother, and uh, and and partly, it, you know, it's an overwhelming thing to try to figure out um, your adoption story. In my case, I'm old enough that all records were closed. You couldn't get at your records if you wanted to. Um, and so, because I was adopted in 1947, which means you know, that was a long time ago. And, you know, it was nearly impossible to get any records connected with anybody. Um, I happened to find a very, I was in Massachusetts, I'm originally from the Boston area, but I did find someone in the state legislature who was sympathetic and in some ways snuck that information out of the archives for me. And um, I'm sworn to secrecy for the rest of my life about who this person was. But, um, and, uh, you know, so then I had the information of my mother, at least my birth mother's name and my birth father's name. So then it, it began sort of a 15 year search after that. And I didn't tell my parents I was searching at all for 15 years until I finally had some idea who they were and where they were um then i talked it over with them because i felt such what guilt was, and what was their what yeah. was their reaction when you did tell them they were sad mm. um they were very you know they were very i mean they were good parents you know and they they wanted the best for me and i you know i don't think they felt it as a betrayal as much as um you know they were you know there hadn't been much research up until that point about adoption trauma. There really was not much at all about adoption. You know, you get adopted, you go to another family, we chose you, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and that was it. There was really no, and it was a lot of secrecy. Mm. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, The Bad Seed, but, mm. you know, <laughs> that was a movie about adoption Um in in the 50s and it was just horrible portrayal of adoption if you ever get a chance to see it it's called um the bad seed yeah and um you know this little girl is evil and she was adopted so you know there was a lot of stuff but so it really resonated for me the struggles the emotional struggles that you put in the book i thought were very um true mm. at least my personal experience i can't speak for everybody else but you know i felt it was a really um close to the emotional trauma well it's interesting that you t also that you talk about secrecy and i think that's that's something that's really really fascinating to me to explore and and i always have this urge to kind of bust open secrets because i just find that that can be such a, a a force of toxicity in groups of people and that that can keep people separate and and alone and um yeah and and i i think something if you if you look at a lot of the themes they a lot of them relate to um alienation and belonging and i think those have been big themes in my life as well and it's a lot of social issues but i think 
they all kind of have that element to them about what does it mean to be outside of and what does it mean to be inside of and how can we create our own insiderness um, especially if we, if we have been rejected by our culture or rejected by our families or um, yeah or even by our workplaces or whatever and I think that's the, 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 the interesting thing is sometimes that impacts us in a way that's that's really dangerous where we want to belong so much that we'll say yes to things that are not good for us and that was something i also wanted to put in the book so that thing with audrey's friendship group and how and the she finally gets the courage to say well no that wasn't okay what happened and um, i can't trust you so i'm gonna walk away yeah and and all the nuance in the book about you know friendship and, you know, like there was a par part in the book where um, Audrey is rejected by a group of friends in Canada. And yeah, she that's what I was talking why. You know, she just doesn't get it. Like, why are they, you know, she's going through this mind jumble of what did I do? What happened? You know, what um, the whole thing was just like, you know, there's so much nuance to to love, as you know, and friendship and, you know, all of that. That you, I think you did a really good job projecting what that anxiety involves and how your little mental monkey wheel in your head, you know, keeps trying to figure out what's wrong. And um, and also the part where um, Audrey has a crush on someone else <laughs> was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, haven't, haven't we all been there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I heard the book, I read somewhere that the book cover was done by your partner. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. We'll show it on the screen when yeah, um, yeah. your interview goes up. So my last question for you is, if you could invite a writer, living or dead, or writers or poets or whoever, to coffee and sit out in front of uh, Capitol Grounds <laughs> and have a chat, uh, who would that be? Well, my first one would absolutely be Virginia Woolf. I've been such a fan of her since college. Um, first of all, I think her writing is just astonishingly interesting and complex and she's so gifted and her mind is so amazing. But I think the real reason I'd want to have coffee with her is because I want to know what it was like at Bloomsbury. <laughs> I just want to know what, like all that, the all, the, all the, you know, beautiful art on the walls and all the drama and everyone like sleeping with everyone. Like, I just find that whole thing so fascinating. Um, I'd want to pick her brain about that. And the second person would be, I don't know if you know, Siri Husbed. Mm-hmm. She's a novelist, but she's also a scientist and a researcher, but she's she's not affiliated with the university. So she's sort of her own researcher. She's sort of a renegade. And she actually did some essays and she talks about, and, and this was really interesting for me as I was taking some lived experiences and making them into fiction. She, talk, she defends fiction as often being more um, truthful than memoir. And she says, there's a quote, she has something like, um, I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong. Fiction is remembering what never happened. Yeah, that's a good. Isn't that good? And I just, and I'm, and I'm super interested in neuroscience. So I'd want to ask her all about that. And there's a novel she wrote about the art world. And I want to know if like she lived any of that. Yeah, I would definitely probably, I would, I would maybe have them on separate coffee dates. I wouldn't want to have them together because they would probably want to talk to each other more than to me. <laughs> I'd want them to talk to me. Yeah. Well, you'd have to have two coffee dates. <laughs> coffee dates. Yeah, I think so. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been delightful for me and I'm sure for our audience and um, good luck. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Linda. It's really been oh. a great conversation. And where can people buy your book if they want to purchase it? I believe they still have copies at Bear Pond. Okay. And they can also go on bookshop.org. Okay. If they really, really have to, they can buy it on Amazon. I'm not <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. 
I'm not a fan, but actually Amazon, I believe is the only one carrying the uh, Kindle version or the ebook. So, okay. So, all right. Well, we'll have all this information up for our audience and thanks again for coming. It was a delight. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.